to Emmanuel Church from the South Downs Way. Lots of love to everyone. Take care. Hi, hi everyone. May you all have a happy Sunday. Bye. Good morning, my name's Lou and I'll be leading the service this morning. It's great to have you join us at Emmanuel Church. We've got some notices and I'm going to hand you over now to Monica with a notice from the leaders. Hello everyone, my name is Monica Cooper. Um, by now you will have received an email about Bless Chichester. And if you didn't get one, could you contact Paul Dixon, our administrator? So basically, God is wishing to bless the shops in Chichester as they reopen tomorrow. And a number of people in our church have received some prophecies about this. And the leaders team met last week, and we believe this really is from God. So this evening and tomorrow morning, we're going to do some socially distanced prayer walks and deliver the, some cards into the shops just with a nice warm note on it um, to encourage them and bless them. And we do need to discern which shops God wishes us to target. So here are three things you can do. Firstly, pray now and ask God to bless this venture. Ask him for any particular message he may wish to convey to us about the shops and let us know. Would you join the shop, the, the walk? A unique opportunity this is to bring the kingdom to, to Chichester, to the hurting businesses and to the fearful people. And if you do need to stay at home, which is absolutely fine please commit to pray while we walk because we will be needing your support as i say this is an amazing opportunity god has given us to take part in bringing his kingdom to our city so come along and see the city flourish despite the virus so see you at the market cross 6 p.m tonight if you can't make that we're going to be there at 7 a.m. tomorrow morning. Uh, so kind of either or, or both if you want to. And um, early tomorrow morning, obviously, before the shops open. Um, so either come along, pray at home, whatever you do, let's grab this opportunity. Thanks. Well, thank you, Monica. Now we have a notice from Paul from the missions team. These are really difficult times at the moment as we face a worldwide health pandemic with coronavirus. Uh, I know that it's uh, impacting your lives as it's impacting mine and many people are really severely affected by it. The missions team met the other day to talk about how we as Emmanuel Church can respond to this crisis uh, both locally and internationally. As a result, we have two videos that we're going to show you in a minute uh, from two organisations that we would like to support financially. One international and one more local. How we're going to do that is over the next three weeks, we're going to be asking for us to show the generosity that God shows us in giving financially. We're going to be collecting money uh, Either you can either send money straight to uh, our bank account uh, or you can go onto our website and we'll have links there which you can pay via your card. These two organisations are really important to us uh, and we've been journeying with them for a while at Emmanuel over different stages. So I'm going to hand over now to Justin and to Lee who are going to explain about the charity. And if you, would, if you feel stirred and, and give, God's prompted you to give, then can I ask you to, to give and to give generously to these charities? We're going to be collecting over the next three Sundays. And at the end of that, we're going to uh, give the money to those two organisations. Good morning, church. So I just wanted to talk to you about the work of a charity I've been involved in for a number of years, which supports two orphanages based in Uganda. Hands of Love UK was established in 2005 and helps support some of the 2,000 children living in these two different orphanages, half of which are in the capital Kampala 
and the other half in a rural orphanage in a place called Lamadi. I had the pleasure of visiting both orphanages a few years ago. This day-to-day -day work is supported by sponsors and supporters in both the UK and America, as well as from a wide network of Ugandan churches. And whilst normally focused on child sponsorship, in recent weeks it's become clear that there's a pressing need to provide support to people in the local communities surrounding the orphanages who currently face a desperate situation. Whilst the direct health impact of the virus has been relatively minor, with no recorded deaths to date, the impact of the associated lockdown on people's daily lives, in particular due to travel restrictions, is leading to widespread hunger. Many families are struggling to find enough food and Hands Love UK is therefore trying to respond where it can by providing additional funds to help with this feeding effort. If you'd like to support this work and are able to spare any money at what I know is a difficult time for many, then please contact myself, Paul or David Grove for further details. Thank you very much for listening. Guys, thank you so much for considering Dale's Dam for uh, giving this uh, amazing gift to and sponsoring us. Um, Dale's Town is doing amazing things for the kingdom and we are in this process of coming up with what's called Project Renew when we have to look at how Dale's Town is going to look in the future. The old model is probably not going to work. Um, so uh, there's some really exciting stuff coming up about that. So if you want to email me or phone me about that, uh, please do. Um, we took a massive hit over the summer due to COVID-19 when over 40 of our solid rock regular customers had to cancel or defer to next year. The amazing thing uh, news we have is that for 2021 and 2022, we are completely booked. You can't even get a weekend in, Emmanuel or one of those bookings. Um, but we took a massive £80,000 loss over the uh, summer period and due to COVID-19. So we are going to launch a project called Project, uh, project Lifeline, which is going to be just begging for money, essentially, because that, that's what we need. We really believe that this is God's work. We believe that it's going to absolutely continue to impact this kingdom. But we just need um, that little bit of financial injection to get us through this really, really hard time. So if any of you can consider giving us, it doesn't matter if it's a couple of quid or you give us lots more than that, every little bit helps. Um, so thank you, thank you so much for considering us. At the end of our service, we're going to gather together for coffee on Zoom. Details can be found on our website along with everything else that's happening in the life of Emmanuel Church. So head on off to www.emmanuelchichester.com And now I'm going to hand you over to Paul. Be high and lifted up, 
Jesus, it's you we glorify, it's you we're lifting high, your name be glorified. Be I and lift it up, be I and lift yes, it up, be I and lift it up, Jesus, it's you we glorify, it's you we lift it up. Work. 
stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Cause when you make a miracle work, promise keep a light in the darkness. My God, that is you. I see your power 
above on the earth Thou art exalted far above O God Thou O Lord art high above Thank you, Paul, for leading us in our worship. And now we're going to go over to Eileen, who's going to lead us in our prayers. During this Pentecostal time, let us pray using the word fire. After each section, we will pause for you to bring to the Lord someone you know who is experiencing the things we are praying for. Dear Heavenly Father, we ask to be blessed and filled with your spiritual fire, to ignite all of us, so that we may put words into actions. The first letter, F, reminds us of how faithful you are, how to command us to be fearless in your name, how we will never be made to look foolish when we fight for all that you have taught us. F also reminds us of all the outstanding frontline workers who pour out their love and tireless work for healing. And we ask that you 
refresh them. The letter I brings to mind intimidation. How in this economic climate, there is pressure to return to work where people feel vulnerable and can't say no. Lord, help employers to behave with integrity and to value their workforce. I also remind us of initiative. Grant all those who are now unemployed the courage to use their initiative to produce ideas for gaining work and to make the right choices at such a challenging time. The letter R reminds us of how your love raises us up. Help us to be the roaring lions of injustice. And we ask you to grant our government discernment in all that they direct us to do. We pray they will be advised by the science to save lives and work with all political parties for the benefit of the common good. We pray for the protection of our police officers and the protection they offer the public. We thank you for our democratic system and we pray we will use it and not abuse it. The letter E brings to mind the word energize. We ask that all the ideas that have been born to protect the environment will be everlasting. We pray for the safety of the astronauts who coming together from different nations are exploring your beautiful creation. And we pray that leaders of all nations will join hands to eradicate all that threatens or persecutes anything that lives. E also reminds us of the promise of everlasting life. We pray for all those who have died or are dying and all those who are grieving. We ask that they receive and realise your promise of life, light and love. So Lord, fill us with your spiritual fire afresh. We ask for all those we have prayed for, that you will bless them with resilience in weariness, discernment in diagnosis, compassion upon compassion, as they go about their day and keep us all in the shelter of your faithful, fatherly, everlasting love. Amen. Thank you, Eileen. We're going to hear the passage from the Bible. We're going to pray that God will speak to us through the word of God. And we'll be looking at Nehemiah 6. I'm going to hand you over now to Paul. Well, good morning. We're going to be looking at Nehemiah today, Nehemiah chapter 6, continuing the story of the book of Nehemiah. So if you've got your Bibles, when you open them to Nehemiah chapter 6 and uh, we'll read it together. When the word came to Sanballat, Tobiah, Geshem the Arab and the rest of our enemies that I had rebuilt the wall and not a gap was left in it, though up to that point I had not set the doors in the gates. Sambalat and Geshem sent me this message. Come, let us meet together in one of the villages on the plain of Ono. But they were scheming to harm me, so I sent messengers to them with this reply. I am carrying on a great project and cannot go down. Why should the work stop while I leave it and go down to you? Four times they sent me the same message and each time I gave them the same answer. Then the fifth time Sambalat sent his assistant to me with the same message and in his hand was an unsealed letter in which was written 
It is reported among the nations, and Geshem says it is true, that you and the Jews are plotting to revolt, and therefore you are building the wall. Moreover, according to these reports, you are about to become their king and have even appointed prophets to make this proclamation about you in Jerusalem. There is a king in Judah! Now this report will get back to the king. So come, let us meet together. I sent him this reply. Nothing like what you are saying is happening. You are just making it up out of your head. They were all trying to frighten us, thinking the hands will get too weak for the work and it will not be completed. But I prayed, now strengthen my hands. One day I went to the house of Shemaiah, son of Deliah, the son of Metahabel, who was shut in his home. He said, let us meet in the house of God inside the temple and let us close the temple doors because men are coming to kill you. By night they are coming to kill you. But I said, should a man like me run away? Or should, or should someone like me go into the temple to save his life? I will not go. I realised that God had not sent him, but that he had prophesied against me because Tobiah and Sambalat had hired him. He had been hired to intimidate me so that I would commit a sin by doing this and then they would give me a bad name to discredit me. Remember Tobiah and Salop, Sambalat, my God, because of what they have done? Remember also the prophet Nodiah and how she and the rest of the prophets have been trying to intimidate me. So the war was completed on the 25th of Elal in 52 days. When all our enemies heard about this, all the surrounding nations were afraid and lost their confidence because they realised that this work had been done with the help of our God. Also, in those days, the nobles of Judah were sending many letters to Tobiah and replies from Tobiah kept coming to them. For many in Judah were under oath to him, since he was son-in-law to Shechaniah the son of Ara, and his son Jehanahan had married the daughter of Meshulam, son of Berechiah. Moreover, they kept reporting to me his good deeds, and then telling him what I said. And Tobiah sent letters to intimidate me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I'm getting to that stage in life now where I need a pair of glasses to actually, a different pair of glasses to read uh, from the Bible. Now, as we continue the story of Nehemiah, we're seeing a, the theme change from the, the justice that we looked at last week to this week, uh, opposition and an increase in the opposition against Nehemiah, steadily building up over the whole of this, uh, this, this chapter and how Nehemiah responds. Now, when our children were little, we would go to the beach while on holiday and they would build little islands and castles with moats in the sand. Then as the, start, the tide would start to rise, the seawater would encroach on the structure and start to threaten the existence of this uh, construction. There would then be a mass building project to erect, fluff, erect flood defences around their castles and their little sort of village that they had created. And I wonder if you, like me, ever feel a little bit like that in your life, as though there are forces at work that want to destroy what you are doing and bring everything tumbling down. Paul in the New Testament speaks of a spiritual battle that we are constantly in. We may not be able to see our adversary, but we do feel the effects of the battle. And in this chapter in Nehemiah, we are told that Nehemiah had finished the wall building project and it was only that the doors needed to be put on, otherwise everything had been done. It is to all intents and purposes completed. He had led the people of Israel well 
through the rebuilding and is a strong governor, a strong leader and a spiritual leader. As is often the case in building God's kingdom, when you do good things, then you become more of a target for opposition. Jesus, in John's Gospel, uh, at the beginning of a really famous uh, uh, verse, says, the thief comes to steal, kill and destroy. But I have come that you may have life and life in its fullness. So the beginning of that says the thief has come to steal, kill and destroy. And you may feel like that sometimes in the battle that actually there is a thief trying to steal the good things that you're doing, steal your, your joy in your life. Uh, to destroy the, the works of God, the kingdom works that you are doing. Sambala and his cronies are not able to undermine the work as the project is now completed or all but completed. However, instead of undermining the project, they focus then on the man and they attempt to discredit Nehemiah himself. It has been my experience that for many in leadership in the church, especially those with prominent ministry areas, that this is a common tactic of the enemy. Discredit them. And then they will not be able to continue doing more. And what they are doing is likely to collapse. This passage uh, then becomes a strong warning and with sound advice attached for all of us, all of us, not just those in, in leadership in the church, but all of us, as we work for God, there will be opposition. And often the, the attack is, on, is to discredit the individuals, it undermines the work and it prevents any further work happening. So, there, so this passage is so important for us at Emmanuel as we look to, to push out and do more for God and to see his kingdom built, see his kingdom come. Let's listen and learn from this passage. Firstly, we see a scheme being developed to try and get Nehemiah away from the safety of Jerusalem. Uh, the, the, the place that's proposed is about a day's walk. So Nehemiah, by the time he's had the meeting and journeyed back, he's gonna be, uh, would be away for potentially three days. So wouldn't his, his, the fact that he'd be missing wouldn't be noticed for at least three days. Once away, it would be easy for them to capture Nehemiah without the, the safety of having all of his uh, family, friends and, and the rest of the Jews around him. So, uh, and this request seems fairly innocent enough on face value, but Nehemiah saw through this. We know from studying Nehemiah as we've journeyed through the weeks that Nehemiah is, uh, is a man of prayer. His behaviour so far has been prayerful in everything he did. So I cannot believe that when this proposition is put to him, that he doesn't first bring it to God and pray through it. How many of us commit our diaries to the Lord? Or do we just say yes when things are asked of us? I certainly do. I just book stuff in when people ask. But Nehemiah doesn't just accept the invitation, he prays first. It doesn't go into his diary until he seeks the Lord. Sometimes the enemy is not trying to kidnap you. In fact, most of the time the enemy is not trying to kidnap you. He's just trying to make you busy and too busy to do the things that are important. Busyness is an enemy to the king to kingdom living it's an enemy to kingdom work and to kingdom fruitfulness Nehemiah, Nehemiah realizes that this is a scheme to harm uh, harm him it's a scheme that will discredit him and so he says no but they persist they write him four letters and every time he says no first lesson to be learned here is uh, pray through things when people ask you to do it. Learn the lessons of Nehemiah and pray through. Is it something that you should be doing and need to be doing? But don't just say yes straight away to things. You know, commit your diary to God and say, 
Yes or no, God, do I do this or do I leave it? And then the next thing that we learn here, the next thing that we learn is it's okay to say no. It's okay to say no. Nehemiah says, no, I'm not going to. And thirdly, he's not worn down by people's persistence. They write him letters and they write more letters and they write another letter and a fourth letter. And every time he says, no, do not be worn down just by people's persistence to get your attention. If it's not right, it continues to not be right. Pastorally, a very difficult situation, I know. And pastors do not like turning anybody down and do not like turning anyone away. But we mustn't give in to persistent requests if the answer from God is no. Sam Ballot then changes his tactics slightly, sends the, a letter, the same letter again with his assistant, but this time it's different. There's an open letter attached to it and the open letter is significant, it's mentioned. And the idea here is that it's an open letter so anyone and everyone gets to see it. The letter is not true, but it is an attempt to discredit Nehemiah's reputation and his intentions. It's an attempt to, to make it look like he is a threat to national security, that actually Nehemiah is making plays at the throne. And it's just not true. The, the, this allegation could be disastrous for Nehemiah. It could lead to his immediate recall back to Susa to answer before the king. Uh, and, and potentially it could lead to his death. You are, the, the allegation is you are threatening the king's throne. That is treason. It, it, and in these times and in those days, it would have led to death. When allegations are made, when people speak ill of you, we need to learn how to grow in these situations. The Bible says that God works for good in all things. So even when people make allegations against you that just aren't true, how do we learn to find what God is doing for good in this? How do we learn how to grow through then? Firstly, I think it's important to examine ourselves because often while the allegation may not be true, there may be a degree of truth in some of the things that are said about us. And so perhaps commit it to God and say, Lord, I don't like this, it hurts. It's a, really, it's a personal attack against me. I don't think it's true. Show me if any of this rings true with you so that I can grow in this. Show me if, I can, if there's anything I can grow in. And then Nehemiah seeks the Lord's strength to get through it. Nehemiah denies the allegations and then he prays for strength. Did you notice that? He prays for strength to continue. He said, that's just not true. He doesn't engage in it any further. He doesn't want to be drawn into that. He just says, it's not true. Writes back to them and says, it's not true. They were trying to draw him out into a meeting and into a big discussion where they could discredit him even more. He just wrote back, said, it's not true. Prays to God and says, Lord, give me strength to continue. And then what happens next is perhaps even more disturbing. Uh, Nehemiah goes to the, and sees a, a, a prophet and he goes into his home, but things are not as they seem. And we know that because we see the story play out. But at the time, Nehemiah did not realise it. The prophet is actually on the payroll of Sambalat. He wants to meet Nehemiah in private. Did you notice that? He wants to meet him in private. He wants the doors shut of the temple. To meet people in private would make the conversation completely deniable. And Jesus in Matthew's gospel, when sending out the disciples, told them to be as wise as serpents and as innocent as doves. And Nehemiah is as wise as a serpent here. Now, I do like meeting people, but there are times when I will not meet people, especially in 
private. Uh, especially when it comes to people of the opposite sex. I, I just don't like meeting them in private in my, in my home unless there's someone here, unless uh, Lou, my wife, is here or someone's with me. I, 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 I meet them in a coffee shop. Why? Because I don't want to be put into a position where people can make allegations against me. And Nehemiah is doing the same here. He doesn't want to be drawn into a temple where the doors are shut. Allegations could be made and there is no witnesses to this. The conversation is deniable. But also there was the potential that Nehemiah could be drawn into something that would be against the law or the Jewish law because there were certain areas in the temple where only priests could go. And we don't know exactly the context that, that this is being spoken into, but there was a potential that Nehemiah could be breaking the law in this as well. And so he says, no, be wise. And sometimes being wise means to ask the question, what does this look like to an outsider? Not, no, I, not, well, I know I'm not doing anything wrong because that's often the case. We know we're not doing anything wrong, but the question is, what does this look like to everyone else? That's the wise question. Perception is really important. I think here, what, what we see happen is uh, Nehemiah realises at this point that this is just a trap. This is purely a, just a trap to distract him. He knows that at this point that this prophet is actually on the payroll. And I think what we see here is in John's Gospel, Jesus is talking about the Holy Spirit and he said the Holy Spirit uh, is the spirit of truth. And so when lies are being spoken, the spirit will break through the lies with truth. And I think the Spirit of God just brings the truth to Nehemiah's mind. And Nehemiah realises what's going on here and he says, no. He says, no. Now, what would you do if this happened to you? What would you do if these people were plotting against you? What if they'd even managed to get this prophet on the payroll who was going to speak uh, allegedly words of God to you, but they were just false. They were false. Uh, there would be a, a, a false prophecy. What would you want? Well, the, the sentence I think we're looking for is revenge is sweet. Or at least that's the saying. But this is not the way Nehemiah responds. And it would be completely understandable if that is what happened. If Nehemiah had cried out to the God and said, I want justice. Lord, I want you to punish him. He's He's he's, they've all sought to discredit me. They've sought to remove me from the situation. They've potentially put my life at risk here. I want you to punish them, Lord. And in fact, the Bible's got passages like that when they cr people cry out to God for justice and say, deal with them, Lord, as they've dealt with us. But that's not what Nehemiah does. Nehemiah just commits it to God. He commits it to God and says, Lord, they've done this to me. Now it's over to you. He very much leaves the punishment to God, the, the only one who is truly able to judge. And, and he just commits these people to them. And this is often one of the hardest responses in the Christian life. And Jesus tells us to forgive people and to pray for those who persecute, persecute us. And, and when you hear that, you think, ouch, that's really hard. It's not that easy to do. But revenge just keeps the wheel of e evil spinning. Forgiveness, however, however hard it is, releases the chains of oppression and allows us to be free from the burden of unforgiveness. And, and unforgiveness can be such a burden on our backs at times. And forgiveness sets us free from that. Revenge is not sweet. It will be a burden that we carry and the evil just is perpetuated by seeking revenge. Forgiveness, forgiveness sets us free from that. So in our lives, when we respond to opposition, how do we do it? Well, let's learn from Nehemiah as we recap. First of all, don't be surprised when opposition comes. In fact, it often means you're doing something right. The more we step out for God, if we're in this spiritual battle, the more we will face opposition. The Bible tells us that uh, 
And that's certainly been my experience. The more I step out, the more I get attacked. Secondly, be wise. Be wise. Be ready to say no. You don't have to do everything that people ask of you. And wisdom is found quite often in the no, as much as it is in the yes. Next, listen to the Lord. Listen to him. Jesus said, the Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth and the spirit will whisper truth into lies and, uh, and break those lies. So listen to the Lord. And finally, forgive and pray for those who persecute you. Jesus, even while hanging on the tree, said, forgive them. Forgive them, they, they don't know what they're doing. See, I don't know what you're facing in your life, but I'm fairly sure there'll be times in your life when you, fa when you face opposition, when you face criticism, people attacking you, they're trying to misrepresent you, they're speaking lies ab about you, or they're just trying to absorb all your time and, and distract you from the things that are really important. If that's you, and if that's where you feel that you are at the moment, then we would love to pray for you. We would love to be able to stand alongside you and commit you to uh, the Lord uh, in prayer. And you can do that by emailing us at prayer at emmanuelchichester.com and someone will be in touch with you and they'll pray down the phone. We do believe that, change, that prayer changes situations and alters realities. So we really want to be praying for you, whatever it is in your life, whatever opposition you're facing. And it may be that you've had negative words spoken over you in the past. And they just echo around your head, reverberating and reminding you of that. And you need to be set free of those. If that's you, again, contact someone. We would love to pray for you. God bless. Thank you, Paul. Now, if anything's spoken to you throughout the service, throughout the worship or the word given, then head on over to our website and find details about how you can contact someone to pray with you. Well, it's been wonderful to gather um, together in our houses and listen to the word and, and worship. So have a great week. God bless you and we'll see you next time.